We are live and today we have Justin Woods, the founder and creator of Genetics and I was previously calling it Gene Ticks. So if it's easier for you to Google with Gene Ticks, that is the name of the company but it's actually known as Genetics. And Justin here, I really think it's important that this conversation is had on tick testing because of my recent experience with my daughter, Evelyn, who had a tick attached to her and we were able to remove it. And when I reached out to public health, I didn't get a response in terms of what to do with the tick or how to get the tick tested. And in my practice, I come across a lot of individuals who are suffering with chronic Lyme, and it takes them years and years to have it resolved and have it properly diagnosed, which Justin has your own, you have your own story with Lyme as well, which led you to create this company. So I think it's really important that we're having this conversation and that individuals be aware that there is testing options out there. Um, because me personally, I didn't get very far with public health. So why don't you give our audience a little bit of a background about yourself and why you created this company? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, yeah, so like Brian said, uh, my name's Justin Wood and uh, I'm the founder of Genetics. I almost said Genetix because you said it. Um, <laughs> I, I started this company because I myself have Lyme disease um, and I have sort of a late stage disseminated Lyme disease as they call it. So um, that's the stage of Lyme disease you get into after you've been bitten, you've passed through the acute stages, you haven't received treatment in an adequate amount of time. Um, and the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, which is called Borrelia, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, starts to spread throughout your body and it starts to infect or uh, affect different systems, different organ systems, different tissues. Um, and you start to have these really diverse ranges of debilitating symptoms, um, can be really very debilitating for people. Uh, so I went through this experience. I started to get sick in about 2011. Um, at the time I was completing my master's, I started to have neurological symptoms that were um, attributed to post-concussion syndrome. So at the time I was playing a lot of sports, I was very active and they kept saying, okay, you've hit your head. So you're having these uh, prolonged persistent symptoms that are attributable to that. And I kind of went with that for a while until I stopped doing sports and I stopped hitting my head and uh, you know, my symptoms kept getting worse and I was having new incidences. So this continued to progress for about three, four years before it all came to a head. Um, I had graduated from my master's and I was about to start a PhD and uh, I just kind of went for a walk one day. It was pretty warm out. Uh, I came back and I sat on my couch and I thought, okay, you know, I really don't feel well. Something's not right. And everything just kind of collapsed and, and came cascading down. Um, it got to the point where I couldn't walk. I couldn't use a computer. I couldn't read. I couldn't listen to music. Um, I had really intense neurological pain. And symptoms started to appear pretty much everywhere in my body. I had muscular pain, I had cardiac issues, um, overwhelming neurological issues. Uh, I would, you know, shake and jitter. Um, and at this time, I think I was about 23, 25. So I should have been a young, healthy individual. I was really active. Um, and it just kept, you know, everything kept falling down. I couldn't work. Uh, I could hardly take care of myself. Um, it took another you know, year or two before I even got a diagnosis for Lyme disease. Once I got that diagnosis, because I had been sick so long, uh, the treatment was not you know, sort of the standard dosage of you know, 21 days to five weeks of doxycycline that you would use in an acute case. Um, and I had to go through really long rotating therapies of antibiotics, some different naturopathic treatments thrown in there before I started to kind of get my life back. So when I did get my life back, uh, you know, to some degree at least, uh, I kind of thought, you know, okay, I really want to be involved in, in fixing this problem. Um, and I started looking at where I thought there was a big issue. And I noticed that there was some tick testing available through Public Health Agency of Canada, but there was a number of limitations to it around, um, you know, how fast you can get your results back, what the testing's for, what type of ticks they will test, even if they'll accept ticks from your area. Um, so I thought kind of the workaround for this would be a company where we offer private testing where people can pay to have the testing done. Um, we've really worked hard to make sure our prices are accessible to everybody. Um, and at the same time, we could use the data that we're collecting on ticks and tick-borne diseases to inform more research in Canada. So we have a better idea of where these diseases are, where the ticks are spreading to, um, how things are changing year by year, um, kind of, you know, push into that direction. So... 
as I started building this company, I started making connections with different researchers and doctors and sort of grown into where it is today, where um, we work with various researchers. We work with the Canadian Lyme Disease Association. Um, and, and we're really trying to push to a place where people who are bit by ticks or are infected with Lyme disease don't have to sit around and guess and wonder, oh, have I been infected? Am I going to get sick? And, and by the time they find out if they're going to get sick, it's too late and they don't have that option for early, easy treatment. So we're really trying to nip these cases in the bud so that people who are infected get treated in the acute stages and they don't have to go on to the late disseminated stages where treatment is difficult and the disease becomes very, very debilitating and the prognosis drops off quite quickly. Do you remember getting bit by a tick? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't. And a lot of people will not. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that we can talk about. Um, in my case, I used to be a, a tree planter. So in the summers, I would go up north and I would plant trees. And, and you're you know living in the bush and you're covered in bugs and everything for um, you know months at a time. And so after my first or second season up there, I started to notice I had some fatigue issues and joint pain that I'd never had before. And I thought it was just from being exhausted from the work. And then over the next couple of years, when I was living out in Alberta, there was a number of times where I was hiking or, or doing something and I would find ticks on me, but I don't recall having any of them embedded and feeding. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the most sort of pronounced time that I remember is I, I walked through some brush and I took my hat off and I noticed there was probably 15, 20 ticks on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then something that I, I can sort of think is that, you can kind of see I've got some long shaggy hair um, and one of the places that people miss ticks the most is sort of behind the ears or in the scalp where mm -hmm. you know you may not necessarily feel it when you wash your hair or something like that and if it's already embedded you know other people aren't going to see it it feeds and then it drops off and you, you never know it's there. Yeah and that's that's a great point too to really check behind the ears in mm -hmm. the hair and also there's a misconception that you have to have the classic bullseye lesion. Yeah in order for ticks to transmit Lyme. And that's absolutely not true. Like you said, you might not even notice that a tick was on you. You might not get the classic bullseye rash or even know. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Alberta and being in the woods, but um, where Evelyn was, we're just outside of mm -hmm. Guelph. They were playing, we didn't think she was playing in the long grass. She had a t-shirt on, a sweater and a coat, and it was on her chest. And it was just a fluke that I was able to notice it was there and it's it really can happen at any point in time or if your pets are out in the long grass and then you snuggle with them yeah. right, and hop from from animals to people as well absolutely unfortunately we're finding especially in ontario and eastern canada that as the tick populations continue to, to grow every single year um, we're seeing ticks sort of push more into suburban and urban areas so people are really contacting ticks in places where you, know, you might not think to be wary of it in your backyard um, people sometimes in, in Toronto and in, in little green spaces, places like that, anywhere that sort of, you know, migratory birds can go or you might find, um, you know, animals like raccoons or deer, something like carry the ticks to, uh, you can find ticks in any of those areas. And like That's you said, if you have pets, there's She's, a good chance they might carry them in as well. Yeah, it's not just a up north camping at your cottage no. issue. And the reason why I came to find Justin and his company was because I had this tick. I didn't know what to do, called Evelyn's pediatrician. And of course, she recommended public health who, you know, her pediatrician nor myself in a medical field. I was not aware that Ontario is currently not testing for ticks. Mm -hmm. So there are private labs out there that you can get really rapid testing. And, and that's what I really appreciated about when I got Evelyn's test results back, there was a picture of the tick, mm -hmm. there was a report and it was very timely instead of waiting four to six weeks, kind of mm -hmm. wondering. And the great thing about having rapid testing is then you can make a more educated decision with your primary care, whether or not treatment needs to be initiated or not, which is um, really great to get them back that quickly. Absolutely. And I wanted to ask you, what types of ticks are you testing or what types of ticks carry infections that people should mm. be looking out for? Is there a good resource to look at? I mean, I did a whole bunch of Googling, like, yeah. is that at the right tick? Is it not? Yeah. So I guess a couple of things that I would say about that um, is that pretty much every species of tick that you can encounter in Canada can carry diseases. Um, I think what people think about the most when they think about ticks is they think about Lyme disease. 
Um, and, and I agree with that because Lyme disease is by far the most prevalent tick-borne disease that we find. Um, Lyme disease is very common in the black-legged ticks or the deer ticks. Um, that's where we find that the most. And we find it at, at quite high you know, prevalence in those ticks. So people often think of things like dog ticks, which are another type of tick, or, or the lone star tick, and they think, okay, well, I'm not at risk with these. Um, but just because they don't really carry Lyme disease at very high prevalence, or some might argue at all, uh, doesn't mean that there's not other diseases in there that we need to be wary of. Um, sorry, what was the other part of your question? I, what, do they, what do they look like? Or would you recommend right. any tick that yeah. you find that's been feeding this mm -hmm. Testing. Yeah, so at Genetics, what we do is when you submit a tick to us, we kind of take the guesswork out of your hands. Um, so when the tick comes, we'll first identify it and we'll see what kind of tick it is. And then depending on the type of tick, we can tailor your testing to be specific to diseases that are more associated with that species of tick. So if a black-legged tick comes in and you want to have it tested for um, more than just Lyme disease, we'll tailor the testing for the species or the, the pathogens that are most commonly associated with the black-legged tick. So that might be, uh, you know, anaplasma and babesiosis and Bartonella and that sort of thing, uh, tick-borne relapse and fever. If it turns out to be a dog tick, uh, things that are more common in the dog tick are things like uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever or uh, tularemia. Uh, Lone star ticks are often associated with uh, Ehrlichia species and a disease called Ehrlichiosis. So depending on what the tick is, we then tailor the testing for you so you don't have to be sitting there online wondering, oh, uh, you know, maybe it's this kind of tick, what kind of testing should I get? If you do want to look, you know, into what kind of, you know, tick you've got, I think a really great resource that people should know about is, uh, it's called tickencounter.com. Um, and it's run out of, I think, the University of, uh, I think it's out of Massachusetts. Um, they have all sorts of really great information about ticks. It's sort of centered on ticks in their area, but Massachusetts is really not too far from us. And we have a lot of the same issues here in Canada as they have down there. Perfect. And I have to say that the, the ordering process was very seamless and easy. You just simply go to the website, place your order, place your order number on the bag, put it in the mail. Yeah. Very easy to do. It's great. Yeah. I really enjoyed that part. What are some things that people can do if they are finding themselves out in the reality of nature? Hopefully they're out spending yeah. time in nature. Like what, is there any like protective clothing or sprays or is it yeah. showering after you get out from being outside? Absolutely. There's a lot you can do to protect yourself about, uh, you know, from ticks. Uh, and I really support that people shouldn't be terrified in sitting in their house, staying away from the outdoors because of ticks. Um, I think you really need to get out there and, and live your life. And I certainly try and spend as much time out there as I can. Um, so I would say that the main things that people can do when they're out there is try to avoid some of the really risk areas for ticks. So these are generally areas of tall grass, wooded areas, uh, places with a lot of leaf litter, um, anywhere where it's sort of damp and moist. So ticks like to kind of hang out in there and wait for somebody to pass by that they can kind of latch onto. So if you're out hiking and you know, you're, you're following a trail, I'd really recommend you try and stay to the center of the t uh, trail away from the long grass on the side because the way that ticks find prey is they'll actually climb up onto that grass and they'll sit there and they'll sense when um, potential prey is coming by. And when they sense you, they put their front arms out and they wait for you to come by so they can kind of grab onto you. They're kind of sticky on their front legs. Mm -hmm. They'll attach to your clothing or something. Then they'll crawl around and they'll look for a soft spot that they can then embed into. So if you can avoid you know, actually contacting the ticks, they're, they're not very mobile at all. Like a tick, uh, at least the ones we have here, won't really chase you. Um, if you're standing two feet from a tick, that it's going to take a while for it to get to you. So as you're walking down the center of the trail, you're, you're safer than if you're walking on the sides. I would also recommend that people wear light colored clothing when they're out. And this way you can see ticks if they get onto you. Um, try and minimize the amount of skin that's showing. Like you're saying with your daughter, if they can find skin, they can kind of crawl up under your clothes and, and become more difficult to find. Uh, there's repellents, which work very well against ticks. So things that carry or uh, contain the active ingredient um, picardin or icardin, those are things like combat spray or uh, pie active. You can find those at Home Depot and, and Shoppers Drug Mart. Those are great for repelling ticks. There's a line of clothing from uh, Wind River that's sold at Mark's Work Warehouse that's been soaked in something called permethrin. Um, and permethrin is a substance that ticks absolutely hate. They want nothing to do with. 
So you can buy these clothes um, and, and you can wear them and, and generally they keep ticks uh, far away from you. Um, a lot of people I know don't really feel great about using chemicals to repel ticks and stuff. So if you're not into that, I know there are some natural sprays out there. Uh, I can't really speak to how effective they are, um, but people do use those. Um, if you're not doing that, or even if you are, I really recommend that there's regular and thorough tick checks. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're with a partner uh, or you know, a close friend, or you're just on your own, uh, make sure that somewhat regularly you're checking each other for the presence of ticks. And some places that people might miss are sort of like, like I said before, behind the ears, the scalp, armpits, groin, backs of, uh, backs of knees. Mm -hmm. It's like ticks really like these like damp moist areas and they'll try to find them. Yeah. And unfortunately, there are also places that a lot of us don't really check. You know, if I come back from being outside, I'm not looking everywhere for these little guys, but, but you have to if you, if you want to be safe. Um, and then sort of the last few things I would recommend is if you can, when you come back from being in the outdoors, take all your clothes off, put them in the dryer, put it immediately on high for about 20 minutes, and that should kill any ticks that are there. Mm -hmm. um, and then just have a shower and make sure, like, you, like I said, you check everywhere. And, and okay. if they are on you and they have an attach you can wash them off and if they are there you find them and you can remove them um in a, you know before they start to really engorge and do you have um any recommendations or resources on how someone should remove a tick i know yeah their, their heads really do get embedded in there and we try our best to you know take tweezers and get as close to the head as possible and yeah. pull straight out to remove that headpiece but is there anything else that you recommend yeah, so tick removal is really important because if you incorrectly remove a tick, you can actually increase your risk of exposure to the diseases that are carried by the tick. So there's a lot of products on the market that I actually warn people against using. Um, so sort of the last thing that you want to do when you're removing a tick. What's that? Is it the tweezers that I just used? No, no, the tweezers are great. They're the, they're the one I support. That's that's kind of it. The, uh, the, the, the products that I kind of don't support are the, uh, you've probably seen the tick keys. Um, and, and the idea behind a tick key is that you sort of slide this key over um, and then you slide it back until it kind of rests around the needle of the tick. It's called the hypostome. Um, mm -hmm. So it sort of slides into place and then you can yank the tick up like that. But what can tend to happen is when you pull that tick key across, you can shear the hypostome off and you leave part of the mouth parts inside of the person you're trying to remove the tick from. And, and sort of the last thing you want to do is leave pieces behind. You don't want to squeeze the tick agitated, leave anything behind. So the cleanest removal method is to use very fine point um, tweezers to get in there sort of as close to the skin as you can, grasp mm -hmm. the tick by the head and as close to the mouth parts as possible. Don't squeeze the body of the tick. Don't jostle it around or anything like that. Just grasp it very firmly and pull up and straight up out of your skin, mm -hmm. not on an angle or anything like that. Yeah. You'll start to notice when you try and pull it up that it actually will feel like it's kind of stuck in there and anchored in there. Um, and that's because that needle that I'm, that I was talking about called the hypostome has all these backwards facing teeth on it. So it really kind of locks into your skin. So you'll feel some resistance. You want to just pull past that straight up and it'll kind of pop out of your skin. Mm -hmm. um, and then check the area after that and make sure there's no mouth parts left. Wash it with soap and water and apply an antiseptic to the area. It is definitely the best practice. And you, you know, if you're squeamish with bugs, you don't mm -hmm. have to worry that bug is if it's stuck there, it's stuck there. So you have time yeah. where you can slowly get your tweezers, yeah. calmly get the head and, and pull it right out. That was my first thing. I was like, Whoa! being yeah. mom. And then I was like, oh yeah, we've learned about this. All yeah. you need is to slowly get your tweezers and be mm -hmm. calm. Yeah, it's difficult not to panic a little. And, and even me, I, I find them you know, still really gross. So yeah. I, I, don't, I don't like to find them on myself either. I totally understand. Absolutely. And what about um, the other practices of, you know, putting essential oils on or burning the tick off? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not recommended. I would highly recommend against that for a number of reasons. The biggest one is though that ticks are, when they're, when they're feeding, they have generally, if there's any bacteria present, they're in, they're in the mid gut or in the salivary gland. And as they feed, those bacteria start to migrate from the gut to the salivary gland where they'll then be passed to the host. So as you stress the tick out by exposing it to oils or burning it, there's this tendency for the tick to regurgitate the contents of its salivary gland. And that's where a lot of those bacteria are waiting. So if they haven't been passed through the normal course of it feeding, 
when you try and remove it that way, you're kind of giving yourself a shot of, or a potential shot of bacteria. And the same goes for if, you know, I've seen some products where it's basically like a sticky piece of fly paper almost, and they just kind of smack it on the tick and then grab it and pull it out. So in that case, you know, you're squeezing the body of the tick and you're sort of forcing those contents out and into the host. Um, and that, that's sort of the last thing you want to do. So I really recommend staying away from those sorts of methods. And like Rand said, if you're, you're squeamish and you're uncomfortable, um, you do have, you know, some time to find somebody who's more comfortable, maybe even steady your hand to grab that tick and pull it out. Mm -hmm. I would say that's a better option than, than rushing through deciding to try essential oils or burning it or anything like that. Yeah, I would agree with that. And who can send ticks to your lab? Is it, I know you're located in Ontario, yeah. but you accept ticks from all over? Yeah, we accept ticks from all over Canada. We actually have two locations. We have a location here in Ontario and a location on the East Coast out of uh, Mount Allison University. Um, we kind of try and recommend that everybody on the East Coast send ticks to our Mount Allison um, location and the rest of Canada send to us here in Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, we do accept ticks from across the border if people feel like sending them, uh, but there's a bit of a hassle with sending ticks across the border. Um, so. A lot of we don't really get a lot of submissions across the border like that, but uh, pretty much anywhere in Canada, we're happy to have ticks from. And then after you remove the tick, say it was on an individual, how long, like if it's been sitting for a little bit, is it still okay to send, or yeah, obviously you want to do it as fast as possible? But what's the the deal? Absolutely, with that? yeah. So the way that our process works is we're not really, you know, the, the tick is sort of just a carrier for what we're trying to detect. So inside the tick are the bacteria and all of those bacteria have, you know, just like any living thing, DNA in them. So what we're detecting are very specific pieces of the DNA of each bacteria that might cause a disease. So when the tick gets pulled off, even if the tick dies or it dries out or something, those bacteria are still protected inside the tick and the DNA is protected again inside those bacteria. So it's quite a process to actually get to the point where the DNA gets degraded to a point where we can't detect it. Mm -hmm. So there's not really, you know, we haven't really seen any ticks submitted past the deadline where that DNA is not of a good enough quality for us to um, actually detect. So I would say that most, it's obviously better if you can submit your ticks quicker and that's better for the patient as well or the customer as well. Mm -hmm. um, but if you remove a tick and a couple months later, you think, oh, I want this tested, that's fine. You can still send it to us. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing we also do is we do a DNA integrity check to make sure the DNA hasn't degraded. So if there was a situation where the tick was stored in conditions that really accelerated the degradation of that DNA, basically we would be able to tell and say, okay, you know, we actually cannot test this tick and we can refund, you know, any money that's been paid to that point. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, we can test ticks that are really quite old. I've seen ticks tested as much as four years later and still be fine. That won't be the case for every tick, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but most people want their ticks tested much, much earlier than that. And if you do want to store your tick for a long period of time, I would just recommend putting it into the freezer and you can keep your, your tick in the freezer and it'll stay, um, it'll, it'll be preserved much better in there. I find it so fascinating. I do a lot of DNA based stool tests mm -hmm. for bacterial overgrowth, parasites, yeah. fungus, and the ability to detect fragments of DNA yeah. is so much more sensitive and specific versus trying to culture the bacteria. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. You doing. really don't need, uh, you know, much. Our, our technique can detect even a single copy of, of pathogenic or bacterial DNA. So if you kind of think about a, a tick with, let's say, hundreds of thousands of, of bacteria in it, even if 99.99% of those are degraded um, and not testable. If there's a single full copy in there that we can use, then that's that's detectable. So uh, it really is a very like sensitive and specific technique, like you said. Yeah, awesome. Now, is there anything else that you wanted to add or some additional resources? I can also post them in the comments below for, I, your website's really great too. I would highly recommend you guys check out the website under resources. There's tons of links to both um, private and government recommendations yeah. in terms of Lyme and the co-infections, but anything else you wanted to add would be great. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of, I mean, in Canada, we actually have a lot of great resources. I would really recommend that people who are interested or, um, you know, concerned about Lyme disease tech, check out uh, the Can Lyme Foundation. Um, so I think their website is just canlyme.ca, Canadian Lyme Disease Association. 
Um, there's a lot of provincial groups as well here in Ontario. We have Lyme Ontario um, and the Ontario Lyme Alliance, which are both really great. Um, also a, a group in Ottawa called Vocal Ottawa. Uh, they have lots of really great resources for people who are concerned about Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. There's a group uh, called Tick Awareness Canada that I would recommend uh, you can check out as well. And then there's lots of local support groups who have a ton of information. Um, so if you're, you know, pretty much anywhere in Canada, if you go on the, Can uh, the Canadian Lyme Disease Association website, um, there's a support group page which has links to support groups for every province. And if you are concerned, you are having issues, uh, you just want more information, I would really recommend getting in contact with them and they can pass on um, almost anything that you would want to know. So th those are probably the, the resources I would recommend. Um, and of course, we're sort of linked to all of these on our website. So if you go to our website and you look at the resources page, uh, you can find almost anything you'd like to find about ticks and tick-borne diseases in Canada. Perfect. Thank you. I was just pulling up. I forgot to see if there was any questions on our video. Sure. But what I'll do is after I'll have a look at some of the questions sure. and I'll forward them on to you if you wouldn't mind responding. That would yeah. be amazing. Or I'll point them to your, your resources. So Perfect. thank you so much for everything that you do. Okay. I see lots of people struggling really hard uh, unnecessarily. So if we can get access to really rapid testing as well as rapid testing for the patient in terms of mm -hmm. you know, it's not as rapid it's about two weeks that you need to wait prior to having your your blood work tested but if we can really point individuals who feel that they are suffering with chronic Lyme to the right practitioners with the right resources for appropriate testing then I think we can make a really big difference in the lives of mm -hmm. a lot of other people so thank you for what you do and thank you for sharing your story and I'll mm -hmm. post all of your contact information um, the website in the comments below as well perfect Thank you. Appreciate it. Talk soon, guys. Thanks. Thank you.